Yeah, many thanks for this kind invitation to the special occasion to speak at the UNESCO World Logic Day, which actually is tomorrow. And also many thanks for this kind um, introduction, Alberto. So I was actually asked to um, present something which um, is at least partly also understandable to a wider mathematical audience of non-logicians. I wonder whether there are actually any um, non-logicians in, in the audience. So um, in case that I bore the logicians, I, I apologize in advance. So what I'm going to, to talk about uh, here. So I, I would like to try to highlight the important role that reducibilities play in, in mathematical logic. So such reducibilities um, are involved in a lot of uh, different topics and I will touch upon some of the uh, some well-known topics here such as Post's problem, the PNP problem, Gödel's first incompleteness theory. But then in the second half of the talk I, I hope to address also some topics which are um, more interesting to logicians because they are related to current research, namely things such as Martin's conjecture and the, the decomposability conjecture. Okay, so I will mostly um, speak about concepts, theorems, and in the end also some proof ideas, open problems, and some possible approaches to, to solve some of these problems. Now, what is the reducibility at all in general? So I, I want to speak about the role that reducibilities play in logic. So I should say some words on, on what a reducibility is. So very generally, um, we can say that it's, it's a relation between problems. So the idea is that we relate two problems, A and B, to each other, and we say that A is reducible to B. Uh, in a situation where it is somehow possible to transform the problem A into the problem B in such a way that solutions to the problem B give us some information about solutions of the problem A. So that's, I think, in a very broad and wide sense, the idea of, of uh, reducibility. So nowadays that there is a whole zoo of such reducibilities. So I don't even know how many there are. There are lots of such reducibilities and they, they can be distinguished in, in several aspects. So one aspect is the type of the problem that we consider. So in other words, it's about what A and B are allowed to be. So in many cases, these are subsets of certain spaces in other cases, they are functions of a certain type. And then the second aspect in which these reducibilities are distinguished is um, how the problem B can actually be used to get some information about the problem A. So typically the relation between these problems is established by a computable map or continuous map. And then there are still differences of how this map actually establishes this, this relation. So such reducibilities have been used in, in many different areas of logic. So perhaps it started in computability theory, um, but then it was also very early on present in complexity theory, in descriptive set theory, in computable analysis, reverse mathematics, just to name a few areas of logic where these um, reducibilities actually appear. So here is a list of some examples of such reducibilities. Perhaps the first ones that were studied uh, in computability theory are many one reducibility and Turing reducibility. So Turing reducibility was introduced by Turing, many one reducibility a little bit later by Post. And so here the, uh, the problems are subsets of the natural numbers. And the relation between A and B is established by a computable function. Uh, and the distinction between many one reducibility and Turing reducibility is that, well, the, fun the um, function is used in a slightly different way. Then polynomial time reducibility is also one of these, these well-known uh, reducibilities 
it's essentially a copy of many one reducibility, but in, in complexity theory, so the polynomial time computable functions are used instead of the computable functions. And then, then we have reducibilities that relate um, sets of a higher type, namely subsets of bare space. And one of those is Medvedev's reducibility that was um, introduced in computability theory. And um, another one is wedge reducibility, which uses continuous functions and this is used in descriptive set theory. So the reducibility that I am most uh, interested in is, is the last one that we call Weirach reducibility. Here are the, the objects, the problems are slightly more complicated. They are not just subsets, but they are multi-valued maps from bare space to bare space. In some of these cases, such as, as the last uh, reducibility, we can even go to other types of spaces, so not just bare space, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, I will just consider bare space to make um, things simple. Okay, so these are examples of uh, reducibilities. So here is um, the first precise definition. So many one reducibility is um, defined with the help of computable functions, namely we say that A is many one reducible to B if there is a computable function so that A is the pre-image um, of B under F. And that means we can kind of use the function F to translate questions to A into questions uh, to B. So this box here kind of uh, this picture kind of um, illustrates the situation. So if we want to know whether a point X is an A, so we want to answer such a yes or no question, we want to, more or less we want to compute the characteristic function of A, then we can do that with the help of B, namely we take the instance that uh, we are interested in and we translate it using the function F into a question to, to B and then from that answer we want to conclude whether the point um, belongs to A. And if this is possible with the help of a computable function, then we say that A is many one reducible to, to B. This, is, this kind of reducibility is kind of a master copy for many other reducibilities. So as I mentioned, polynomial time uh, reducibility is essentially the same thing, except that we replace the computable function by a polynomial time computable function. Also, wedge reducibility is essentially defined in exactly the same way, except that we are working with subsets of bare space and the function is, is requested to be continuous. So in a, in a certain sense, so this is a prototype of a reducibility and lots of other reducibilities are kind of manufactured in, in a similar way uh, as, as this one. Okay, so what are, what are the typical properties of such a reducibility? Well, we typically expect that it's a pre-order, so it's reflexive and transitive. That um, really makes it a reducibility in a certain sense because we want to compare problems and so it, it should have these properties. We don't expect that it's a total order and in most cases of these reducibilities, it's, it's not a total order, so we there can be incomparable problems. Then the uh, terminology in, in this field is that we call the equivalence classes degrees. So we speak about things like many one degrees, Turing degrees, polynomial time degrees, Medvedev degrees, Weirach degrees, and so forth. And what we mean by that is, is the equivalence classes. So the, uh, the corresponding um, degrees uh, um, they are uh, ordered by this um, uh, relation, but we don't necessarily get a lattice structure. So in many cases we have an upper semi-lattice, so that means binary suprema exist, but we often don't have a lattice structure. Some of the reducibilities like Weirach reducibility or Medvedev reducibility, they actually give us even a lattice structure but um, in, in most cases, we, we don't get a lattice structure. 
there is a well-established terminology of being a complete a P, uh, being a complete problem for a class of problems and what that means is that if a problem a belongs to c and it's uh, the most complicated problem in the sense that all the other problems in c are reducible to to a then we say that a is complete so it's kind of a maximal maximally complete uh, problem in a, in a certain class it's not a well-established terminology, but we could speak about co-complete problems if we have uh, the simplest problem in, in a certain class of problems. And we see uh, a lot of such examples in, in a second. So here is the situation for, for uh, many one um, reducibility. So we have kind of the computable sets as the bottom of this order structure so a set is called computable if there is an algorithm to decide membership it's called computably enumerable if there is an algorithm that can enumerate all the members uh, of that corresponding set of natural numbers and we have a complete problem here an example of such a complete problem is is the well-known halting problem that decides whether a program halts on some input Okay, so a simple diagonal argument shows that this um, halting problem is, is not uh, computable. So we um, can actually separate the classes of C, E and um, computable sets. This is not so easy in, in the polynomial time uh, case. I mentioned that polynomial time reducibility is, is defined analogously. So we, we have an analogous situation here with the polynomial time computable problems being at the bottom and um, the so-called satisfiability problem is playing the role of the halting problem here. So it's complete, it's NP complete, complete for the class NP. And then there was this idea in complexity theory. Well, let's take this most complicated problem like in, in computability theory and we prove that it doesn't belong to P and we could then show that P is different from NP. Unfortunately, the strategy hasn't been successful so far. So the, the P and P problem that asks whether P is equal to NP is still unsolved. You know that it's one of the millennium problems. Um, so one of the big open problems which are directly related to a reducibility. I don't want to say anything more about the um, PNP problem here, but I want to come back to the um, computability situation. So it's, it was very simple to separate uh, the CE sets and the computable sets in this case. Um, however, this immediately raises the question whether there are problems in between here. So problems which are CE, not computable, and not many one equivalent to the halting problem. So in other words, is the middle region of this triangle here inhabited at all? And that is uh, also a classical problem that is long uh, solved. So a concrete specific example was provided by Komogorov. So he was defining the set of uh, random numbers and the complement is called here the set of lawful numbers. So what are random natural numbers? So if, if you have uh, a natural number which looks like that, a one followed by a lot of uh, zeros, you can provide a very short program that actually prints this number just by saying print one, one followed by so and so many digits, zero. However, if I give you the task to, to write a program that produces this, uh, the second number here, then probably there is no better uh, way of doing it but just to copy this number as a constant into your program and, and to print it like that. So that means for the second number, there is perhaps no shorter algorithmic description than just printing the number itself in, in writing the number itself into the program. So this leads to the distinction between random and lawful numbers. So a random number would be one where there is no shorter program, um, but the num shorter than the number itself, and a lawful number would be a number where there is a shorter program. And Komogorov showed that the set of non-random or lawful numbers 
is a computably enumerable set, which is neither computable nor many one equivalent to the halting problem. So there is a natural such example in other words of, um, of such a problem. So the set of lawful numbers, it sits here, it's neither computable nor equivalent to the halting problem. And its complement sits somewhere outside here. Now I was speaking about um, complete problems. I mentioned that there is this dual notion of co-completeness, which is the simplest problem in, in a class. And we have here automatically also um, such a situation, namely the complement of the halting problem is uh, co-complete for the class of productive sets. So what is a productive set? Productive set is a set where given an index, so a, a program or a description of a CE subset B of A, you can actually compute a point in the complement, a point which is in A and not in B. So if that is possible, then you have a set which is highly non-computably enumerable. It is not just not computably enumerable, but given any possible candidate uh, of a CE set, we can find a witness of a point which is not in that set, but in A. And so uh, we can kind of prove in an effective way that the set is not CE. And the complement of the halting problem is um, minimal with, with that property. So we also have interesting minimal sets in that sense. And that's related to another famous problem in logic, namely Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, which we can state here such that the set of true arithmetic formulas is productive. So an arithmetic formula is a formula like, like this one here, for all A there exists a B so that something holds which involves addition, multiplication, equality here in this case. Of course, this formula here is not true, but um, if you look at the true formulas, then they actually form a productive set. So how can one actually prove such a thing? It's, it's not too difficult. All you need to do is you need to describe the complement of the halting problem by a set of true arithmetic formulas. So you have to kind of um, describe the computation of a machine in such a way so that for a particular input, your formula will become true if, uh, if and only if the machine does not hold. And if you can uh, manufacture such a formula in a computable way, then you have a reduction from the complement of K to the set of true arithmetic formulas. And that immediately gives you this version of Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. Namely, there is a computable method that given any CE set of true arithmetic formulas, so these are, we think of these as our axioms, um, that method determines a true arithmetic formula which is not formally derivable from, from the axioms. So our, whatever the axiom system is, if it's computably enumerable, um, it will be incomplete. And not only that, this is a strong version of uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. We can even, in a computable way, determine witnesses for, for this uh, failure. So this is an illustration how reducibilities are actually involved here if you, if you come up um, with, with these uh, results. By the way, I should mention that you should interrupt me at any time if there are any questions. I think we have enough time to allow for questions here during my talk. Okay, let's come back to Turing reducibility. So, which is um, a little bit um, wider in a certain sense than many one reducibility. So it's also about subsets of the natural numbers but now we think of these subsets as points in bare space. And we say that the set A is Turing reducible to B if there is a computable function, now a computable function on bare space, so that A is uh, the image of B. So it's the input B gives us the output A. So these 
A and B are now points in the input and output space. So that means that in such a computation, we can now use B in, in a wider sense than in a many one reduction. In a many one reduction, we can only ask a single question to B to come to a conclusion whether our input belongs to A or not. Now, in case of Turing reducibility, we can ask a lot of questions to B just to uh, learn whether a specific input X belongs to A or, or not. That means we have, um, we have more flexibility here to use B, the so-called Oracle. And that means that many one, if something is many one reducible, then it's also Turing reducible. The inverse reduction, uh, the inverse implication uh, doesn't hold in this case. So there are examples like uh, the set of lawful numbers that I just mentioned, which is Turing equivalent to the halting problem, but not many one equivalent. So it was an example of a set which is not many one equivalent to the halting problem, not computable, but uh, CE. Now, since the set of lawful numbers is equivalent to the halting problem, this raises once again uh, a question that I mentioned before for the many one, uh, for many one reducible uh, reducibility, but now for Turing reducibility. Namely, are there any CE problems which are neither computable nor Turing equivalent to the halting problem. So obviously the set of lawful numbers can no longer be an example because um, it is Turing equivalent to the halting problem. We need other examples. There's a famous uh, solution of that uh, question, uh, theorem proved independently by Friedberg and Mutnik. And they showed that there are C sets which are incomparable with respect to Turing reducibility. They introduced a new method, the priority method in, into computability theory, and that led to an explosion of similar constructions. And it showed that the order structure is extremely complicated, the order structure of a Turing reducibility. However, this construction is kind of not giving us natural or good examples of, um, of such sets. So we could reformulate uh, Post's questions, are there any two natural, not even necessarily CE, examples of problems that are incomparable with respect to Turing reducibility? And there, there is no good answer to this question. So we don't know any such two natural examples, of course, here, the question is, what is natural supposed to mean? But I will tell you what, uh, what is known about it. So we know that there are infinitely many linearly ordered natural problems. Namely, um, they can be defined with the help of what is called the jump of a set. So the jump of a set A is just the halting problem relative to A. So that means uh, the question, does a certain program on a certain input hold? But here, the program is now allowed to use the Oracle A as an additional um, resource. And the question is, does such a program hold? It's more complicated than, uh, the jump of a set is more complicated than the original set. And so starting from the empty set, we get an increasing chain of more and more complicated problems, but they are all linearly ordered, whereas um, this uh, incomparability here tells us that uh, Turing reducibility is anything else but lean, uh, linear order. So it's a very complicated order, even in the CE sets, it's, it's not total. Now, a lot of natural problems which are known, or basically all natural problems which are known, are equivalent to um, some jump of the empty set. So for instance, the halting problem is equivalent to the jump of the empty set. The, as I mentioned, the randomness problem. So the question whether a natural number is random or lawful in the sense explained before that's in this equivalence class, the word problem for finitely gener uh, presented groups, uh, Hilbert's tense problem. So the quest, that's the question whether a given Diophantian equation is uh, solvable or not. 
that's also in, in that equivalence class. And then you can create variants of these problems. For instance, the totality problem is the problem of whether a given program holds on all inputs. That's on the next level of the second jump of the empty set. And using a similar idea, you can uh, also um, modify problems from algebra or on Diophantine equations so that you, you get into the same equivalence class. Then the co-finality problem is the problem does a program hold on all but finitely many inputs. Uh, that's on the next level of the hierarchy and so forth. The set of true arithmetic formulas, which I mentioned before in the context of Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorem, that requires the omega jump. And the omega jump is defined like this. And basically, the situation is that all known natural problems, they are in this linear order of jumps. So they are uh, equivalent to some jump of the empty set. And the question is, how can this be explained? So imagine you are working in astronomy and you, you see uh, a sky full of stars. And you, you know that it's a very complicated structure with lots of points in many different positions. That's here my analogy for, for the Turing degrees. So these are the Turing degrees now. And now you look, uh, you ask the question, which of these stars are inhabited? So on which of these stars do you find life? And suppose the answer is, well, we have these stars here which are inhabited by living beings of some kind. And these stars, they are all uh, in a linear order and they are all equidistant. So that would be a very surprising situation. And of course, an astronomer would like to know why, why this happens. So why are we in this uh, peculiar situation? And that's more or less exactly the, the situation that we face in, in the Turing degrees. We have lots of Turing degrees that we can construct, but the interesting ones are, are ordered like this. And one attempt to approach this question is actually Martin's conjecture. So in Martin's conjecture, we, uh, Martin, adult Martin, tried to formulate a condition that gives us some partial explanation for, for this uh, behavior. And the idea here is we are now not looking at, at uh, individual um, problems, so not at these uh, individual stars, but we are looking at maps because the idea is that any problem should be have a more uniform description in terms of a map. So we are not now talking about maps from Turing degrees to Turing degrees. D here denotes the set of Turing degrees. And the and Turing reducibility gives us a partial order on these uh, Turing degrees, which is denoted without the index T. And so what does Martin conjecture say? So here is a, is a kind of simplified version, a Borel version of Martin's conjecture. It says that every Borel function on the Turing degrees is either constant on a cone or equivalent to an iterate of the Turing jump on a cone. So that is basically saying that essentially there are no other functions on the Turing degrees, but the constant functions and the iterates of uh, Turing jumps. And essentially here means that, um, well, at least on a cone, a cone is a set that is given by some Turing degree C and we look at all the points above that point and we call it the Turing cone or cone of, of that point. So what that basically means is that of course these functions can be such that we have for instance finitely many exceptions but essentially so on a cone these functions are either constant or um, equivalent to an iterate of, of the Turing jump. So we need to restrict this here to Borel functions 
So you could look at it by saying, so if the function is not too complicated, then it has to be like that. And so if that conjecture could be proved, then we would have some kind of explanation for why we see this peculiar uh, structure um, that the only inhabited problems are, are in that linear order. I should mention that the original version of Martin's conjecture is, is a little bit more general. So instead of looking at Borel functions, one could also look at all functions, but then one needs to modify uh, the set theoretic assumptions. So in that case, um, the uh, conjecture would come under the assumption that we use the axiom of determinacy. The axiom of determinacy is saying that a certain type of game um, is such that either player one or either player two uh, always uh, has a winning strategy in, in each of these uh, games. And um, that axiom is known to be incompatible with uh, the axiom of choice. So it's kind of an alternative setting for, for mathematics. And if we use this alternative setting, then we could uh, remove here the Borel condition and work with all functions, but in this alternative setting. It is not too difficult to see that if we look at all functions and we allow for the full axiom of choice, then we can construct counterexamples to this conjecture. So in other words, um, using the axiom of determinacy or alternatively, uh, the Borel condition here is not superfluous because otherwise the, the conjecture is, is false. Now, again, this conjecture of course has to do with reducibilities because it is related to Turing reducibility, but it is also related to reducibilities in a different way. And I want to um, come to a very recent result now. That's a result by Patrick Lutz and Benjamin Siskind. They kind of solved Martin's conjecture for a special case, namely for the special case of order preserving functions. So order preserving just means that the function is, is monotone in, in the uh, straightforward sense. That's a very natural condition because you could say that these are the homomorphisms of our structure. I mean, we are working in this order structure of Turing degrees with some order and being monotone is, is a very natural condition for, for this structure. And for these order preserving functions, um, uh, Lutz and Siskin proved that uh, they are either constant or equal to the identity or above the Turing jump. And each of these conditions is, is uh, meant to hold on a cone. So together with earlier results of Slayman and Steele, this actually settles Martin's conjecture for the special case of order preserving functions. And um, I should mention that there is a second kind of related big open problem here. Namely, it's not known whether there are any non-trivial automorphisms on the Turing degrees. So um, that is kind of uh, related and also open. But let's come back to, to uh, the result of um, Lutz and Siskind. So they presented actually uh, I think at least three different proofs of this theorem in slightly um, different settings. And one of these proofs uh, uses Solecki's dichotomy. I will tell you in a second uh, what that is about. Um, but uh, essentially, they made a case distinction. So they looked at functions on bare space, with, which represent this function on Turing degrees that they consider. So what does it mean? Um, so here it is explained what I mean by uh, representing a function. So a function on bare space, capital F can, can represent such a function, little f on Turing degrees in the sense that if I plug in a set from uh, a degree, then the function value will be in the certain uh, function value degree. Okay, so if we look at such a representing function, 
then they made a case distinction. So either that function has a property which is called sigma continuity. I will tell you in a minute what that is, or it doesn't have that property. In the first case, they used an old result of Slayman and Steele to show that the function is either constant on a cone or equal to the identity. And in the second case, they use Solecki's dichotomy and viral reducibility in order to show that the function is above the Turing jump. Now, in order to make this more understandable, um, I will tell you a little bit about viral reducibility and then also about um, sigma continuity. So what is viral reducibility? As I mentioned before, this is a reduction that now works on multi-valued maps on uh, bare space. So of course these are just relations, but we prefer to talk about them as maps because we really think about inputs and outputs here. And um, okay, now what does it mean that F is strongly viral reducible to G? Well, it means that there are two computable maps H and K that kind of translate F into G in the sense given here and illustrated in this picture. So that means if I have an instance X on which I want to evaluate F, then I translate this instance into an instance for G with the help of K. And then I get some of the possible results of G. And if I uh, plug that into H, then H will give me a solution for F. So I can kind of use G once here, like in many one reducibility, but now it's not a set, but a function, a multivalued function, can use it once here to get a solution for, for F. Let me uh, quickly speak about a one problem that I was uh, working on myself. So you can ask now, for instance, a question such as the following, is there a simplest discontinuous problem with respect to that reducibility? I should mention here that there are different versions of this reducibility. So the most used reducibility is the one where we have computable translations here. So the input and output modification is established by computable maps, but we could equally well use continuous maps K and H here. And in that case, I denote the reduction with the star here. So the star is saying kind of um, any oracle is allowed and that corresponds to continuity. And so this is the topological version of strong via reducibility. And with respect to that reducibility, you can ask, is there a simplest discontinuous problem? That's a bit similar to the question or a bit similar to, to what uh, I told you about the halting problem. So the halting problem can be seen as kind of the simplest, natural, unsolvable problem with respect to Turing reducibility. As I told you, there are no natural candidates known which are non-computable and not Turing equivalent to, to the um, uh, halting problem. So in other words, this question here was about a simplest such problem with respect to this reducibility. And so I was able to, to find such a problem, which is which I call the discontinuity problem, has a very simple definition, namely um, U is a universal computable function here. And the task is given some input P for this universal function, find some output Q, which is different from the output of, of U. So that sounds uh, very trivial, but you have to keep in mind that U is a partial function. This inclusion symbol here indicates that this is a partial function. And so if P is not in the domain of U, then any Q would be allowed as an answer. And if P is in the domain, then, well, we, any uh, answer is allowed except the output of U. And that makes the problem discontinuous. So there's no continuous solution for this problem. And it's actually the weakest discontinuous problem uh, in the um, 
topological version of strong viral reducibility. Also, if you know what it is, also with respect to ordinary viral reducibility. Um, however, also this, results come, uh, this result comes under the assumption that we are working with the axiom of determinacy. So if we are working in that setting, um, then actually this is the simplest problem. So we have such a dichotomy here. The continuous problems are below the identity and the discontinuous ones are above the, the discontinuity problem. Like in case of Martin's conjecture, you get a Borel version here. So if you don't like to work with the axiom of determinacy, forget about the axiom, but restrict yourself to uh, Borel problems. And then once again, the uh, discontinuity problem is, is the weakest uh, problem. Again, one can prove that without the axiom, uh, sorry, with the axiom of choice, um, there are uh, counterexamples to, to the first theorem here, and they can be constructed with so-called Bernstein sets, which are known from the script of set theory. And it's worth mentioning here that they play a similar role here as the um, non-random sets of, of Komogorov. So you could say in a certain sense, the Bernstein sets are the uh, descriptive set theory counterparts here of the uh, non-random sets. For those of you who are interested in, in determinacy questions, I, I have uh, one question here, perhaps you can answer it. Um, we can introduce the concept of viral determinacy, which just means that every problem F satisfies that it's either below the identity or the discontinuity problem is reducible to it. And from the uh, results that we have, it follows that this property sits somewhere in between the axiom of determinacy and wedge determinacy. And um, so it's um, an obvious question whether it is perhaps equivalent to the axiom of determinacy or equivalent to wedge determinacy. As far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's an open problem where the wedge determinacy is equivalent to the axiom of determinacy. So if that would be the case, then of course this was, would also answer my question here. There is a Lipschitz version of VAR of determinacy, which can be proved to be equivalent to the axiom of determinacy, but I don't know the answer for the non-Lipschitz version. So someone is interested in this, I would be happy to, to learn the answer. Okay, now I mentioned um, the partial solution of Martin's conjecture by Lutz and Siskind. One of their proofs used Solecki's dichotomy. So what is Solecki's dichotomy? Solecki's dichotomy says that um, every function on bare space is either sigma continuous or the so-called Pavlikovsky function can be and topologically embedded into F. So what does all this mean? So sigma continuity just means that um, we can find a countable um, sequence, of, uh, a sequence of sets that uh, whose union is our entire domain and restricted to these sets, our function uh, is continuous. So we can kind of decompose our function f into these countably many uh, continuous functions. That is sigma continuity. No additional requirement on the, on the type of sets. And this notion of topological embedding here that uh, is defined with topological embeddings in, in the way given here. So we could look at this notion of a topological embedding as yet another notion of reducibility, if you wish, even though it hasn't been uh, coined or named like that, it is somehow kind of a reducibility. So it was observed by several people, um, for instance, by Patrick Lutz, as far as I know, also by Raphael Caroy, that this reduction, uh, sorry, this topological, this notion of topological embedding implies the topological version of strong viral reducibility. And 
I didn't tell you what the Pavlikovsky function is, but Patrick Lutz proved that it's topologically strongly viral equivalent to the Turing jump function. And so we can rephrase the, the Pavlikovsky dichotomy, uh, sorry, the Solecki dichotomy in the way given here on the bottom, namely every function on bare space is either sigma continuous or the Turing jump is viral producible, strongly viral producible to F. So this gives us such a picture. I already told you that the continuous problems here, they are all below the identity. The discontinuous multi-value problems, they are above the discontinuity problem, at least if we accept the axiom of determinacy or if we restrict everything to Borel problems. We don't need the axiom of determinacy for the observation that there is also a simplest single-valued discontinuous function, which is just the zero test on bare space, also called LPO. And then we have this equivalence class of the uh, Turing jump, which also contains the limit map on bare space and the Pavlikovsky function, and that's kind of minimal for the non sigma continuous functions if you accept um, the axiom of determinacy. And it's worth mentioning that this equivalence class is not just co-complete for the non sigma continuous functions, it is also complete for the sigma 2 measurable functions. So these are the functions where the preimages of open sets are f sigma sets. Okay, so that brings me to the next uh, open problem that I want to, to discuss here, namely the decomposability conjecture. And once again, it turns out that reducibilities could play a crucial role here in, in understanding that um, conjecture. So it's essentially a conjecture saying that two classes, two function classes are identical. So they depend on two natural number parameters, N and K, and they both kind of measure the complexity of functions. By sigma nk, this is just a notation used for the purposes of this talk. It's not a common notation. By, by this, I denote the class of functions so that pre-images of sigma zero n sets are sigma zero k sets. These sigmas here, they, they denote the classes of the Borel hierarchy. So we start with the open sets, then we get to the f-sigma sets on the next level and so forth. The delta sets are the um, corresponding delta classes uh, of the Borel hierarchy. So this describes what I, I mean by sigma nk and by delta nk, uh, we denote a class that measures the complexity of functions in a different way, namely, uh, we want to decompose the function again, like in the case of sigma continuity, but now the decomposition is a little bit more general. We don't demand that the uh, decomposed functions are continuous. We only demand that they are sigma k minus n plus one measurable. So that means preimages of open sets are sigma k minus n plus one sets. And the decomposition of the domain now has to be such that the sets are delta k sets in the Borel hierarchy. And the question is, are these two different ways of measuring the complexity of functions, are they identical? So um, for, for n and k being equal to two, this is known to be the case. That's the famous Jane Rogers theorem. And that was proved in 1982, then there was no progress for a long time on, on this question, but in 2009, Brian Samus proved essentially the cases for k equal to three. However, just restricted to uh, bare space. So proof that in those cases, the classes coincide. Uh, more recently, Ding, Kihara, Samus, and Sao um, settled it for the same parameters also the general question. In the general question, we are not just working with bare space, but with 
separable metric spaces. Um, in, in general, X has to be analytic. Now, how can you prove the Jane Rogers theorem? So there is another dichotomy also by Solecki. So I call it the second dichotomy of Solecki here, um, which can be used to prove the Jane Rogers theorem. So this second uh, dichotomy by Solecki says that the function is uh, either delta zero two piecewise continuous. So that means it is in the class delta two two, or uh, it is such that one of these two Lebesgue functions can be topologically embedded into F. I don't want to define what, what the, these two Lebesgue functions are here, but well, that's uh, the statement. And it's important to mention it works for Bayer class one functions. So from that, you can conclude the Jane Rogers theorem. So you can prove the case for the parameters two because this Lebesgue, the, both of these Lebesgue functions, they are easily seen to be not sigma two, sigma two measurable. So it means pre-images of sigma two sets are not uh, necessary sigma two sets um, under those functions. And that kind of transfers via this topological embedding to F. So if we are in the second case here, uh, we are, um, not in the class sigma 2, 2, and that gives us the um, desired uh, identity of these two um, ways of measuring complexity. Now, Solecki, in his uh, paper, he noticed that you cannot get a similar result with only one function. So there is no single minimal function here, so to say cannot replace L and L1 by a single function. However, if you widen the reducibility a little bit and you use strong Weierbach reducibility again, then it works because L1 is strongly Weierbach reducible to L. And in fact, the corresponding complexity class uh, or class of uh, the corresponding degree, corresponding Weierbach degree, is already well studied in, in Weierhoff complexity. It's the same degree as the degree of the so-called sorting problem. Now we get such a picture here in the strong Weierhoff lattice, the topological version. Namely, if we look at functions which are bare class one, so that means essentially functions below limb here in the blue cone, then within that blue cone, we get a dichotomy. So either our function is um, delta 2,2, 2, but that can be easily seen to be equivalent to being below the um, problem called limb delta. So limb delta is the limit on bare space, but not with the bare space topology, but with respect to the discrete topology on bare space whereas limb here is the limit map with respect to the ordinary bare space topology. So this limb delta is actually complete for the class delta 2, 2. And from Solecki's dichotomy, the second one, it follows that L1 is, uh, is minimal, so it's co-complete for the class of problems, which are the class of functions which are not in delta 2, 2. So in some sense, with uh, viral reducibility here, so the picture is a little bit nicer than with um, Solecki's notion of a topological embedding because we have a single minimal problem here. And actually, so this is now about ongoing research of uh, mine. So it's uh, not completed, but this gave me an idea of how one could approach the general uh, decomposability problem. Namely, it's not so difficult to find complete problems for all these delta classes. So in the strong bio lattice, you can actually manufacture problems which are complete for all these delta classes. And they, they are ordered like uh, giving in the structure here. So an arrow means the problem at the um, head of the arrow is reducible to the problem on the other side. And 
it can also be read as an inclusion of the corresponding data classes in, in this direction. So from bottom to top, we get an uh, inclusion. So all these classes are sort of like that, and it's easy to find um, complete problems here. And the idea is uh, that we kind of use the discontinuity problem and a modified version of it to, um, to approach the decomposability problem. Namely, it's not too difficult to show that not only do we have complete problems here, but we also have co-complete problems for the non-delta zero and k classes, which are modified versions of the discontinuity problem. And now it would suffice to prove only in quotation marks that these discontinuity problems are not sigma n sigma k measurable, which is at least looks like a simpler task than dealing with the general uh, definitions of these um, complexity classes. However, that might not be true, so it's not so easy to show this. I think I can I can do it for infinitely many parameters, but not for all. And um, well, that's work in progress, as I mentioned here, but it's an idea of how one could uh, actually approach uh, the decomposability problem. So we are already at the end of the time. I hope I have at least given you some cross section to and ideas on certain problems that are related to reducibilities. And I hope at least some of them were interesting to you. So here are some of the references that I've used for the preparation of my talk. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, I think uh, you, you you mix different uh, stuff, which is uh, which is very nice, and you showed a lot of connections between different areas. So I think uh, we can ask questions. Just uh, unmute yourself and uh, speak up. So let, let me be the first one asking a question. So in, in your last slide, basically you are, you are saying that you already are able to show in some, for some specific values, at least of NK, also the last, uh, the last step. So that means that you are able to get uh, the decomposability conjecture in some unknown up to now cases. Is this correct? Did I get it right? Well, I, I don't want to make too bold claims here at this point because it's work in progress. So I'm still writing this up, but yes, I think I, I have, ways to approach uh, these cases here, so which are um, related to the classes delta 2, 2, 3, 4, and so forth, so where the second parameter um, goes up here. This is simply because, as you can see, if you go um, vertically up here in this diagram, then these complete problems on each level, they are jumps of the problems on, on the level below and kind of the, the dichotomy uh, is transferred together with these jumps and, and that kind of um, uh, essentially tells you um, or could give you a solution of the decomposability problem for those parameters. But it's not so clear how you can transfer this if you make a step to the right. So you can make a step to the top, but uh, not so obviously to the right. Um, that's at least not clear to me yet, but I, as I mentioned, it's work in progress. So it's not so difficult to get these dis discontinuity problems here, but it's hard to see that they actually don't have these measurability uh, properties because there is a universal function involved in the definition of these discontinuity problems. and. Even though we are just talking about a single problem, uh, the single problem is kind of uh, difficult to handle because it involves a universal function. Okay. Other questions or comments? 
I have a, a slight question, which is uh, you with the um, Borel conjecture, you say that uh, the Martin's conjecture, you say that the result uh, was a solution, but it, it just said that either you are constant or above the jump, while you would have to be equal to an iterate of the jump. You mean here this result? Um, yes, yes. Yeah, as, as I mentioned below here, so if, if you look into the original version of Martin's conjecture, it has cases A and B. And okay. your, your question is related to the, to the part B with the jumps and the structure you get for these jumps. So what Patrick Lutz and Benjamin Siskin did is, is related to part A. Part B was already solved much earlier by Slayman and Steele. So together with this earlier result, you get a solution of Martin's conjecture restricted to order preserving functions. So you get a solution. So for which which case, case is this result setting the, the part where you have a constant function or the, the where, where you have regressive function or the part where you have an increasing function? Uh, sorry, I didn't get that question. So it's it's solving the case of uh, regressive function or it's solving the case of increasing function. No, no, I'm I'm saying this result of Lutz and Siskind yes corresponds to part A of Martin's conjecture and Slayman and Steele's result. Another one which is not cited here, it's not stated here. The result of Slayman and Steele. It's okay. another result that solves the second part of Martin's conjecture and together with. Siskins and Lutz's result, you, you have a full solution for order preserving functions. So all this is only for the special case of order preserving functions. So it's not a full solution of Martin's conjecture, but for order preserving functions. But then the non order preserving functions are apparently the non interesting ones. So it remains. Uh... Yeah, you could say that the. I mean, I agree that uh, in a certain sense, you can say that that is a, a solution in some sense, but the original conjecture is not just for order preserving functions. In that sense, it's not fully solved. But is that a natural example of a non order preserving uh, function? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I I can't. Uh, of course, you can um, you can uh, find some easy examples, but uh, you want some that is not even uh, order preserving on a cone, right? And uh, yeah. okay. the problem is that that we don't have any net. I mean, basically, the conjecture is saying there are no other interesting functions, and so I can't give. If I had an example um, that violates the conjecture, then I, I would have disproved it. <laughs> okay, sorry. Other questions or comments? If not, I think we can uh, thank Vasco again for his uh, very nice talk.